As far as my credentials as a charity streamer, I helped Joel Ruiz run two Critical Bits Spider Day charity streams to raise money for Covenant House Georgia. With those two plus charity t-shirt sales, we raised around $4,500 total, I think. I scheduled and ran a Critical Bits Make-A-Wish Georgia stream, which raised $1,900. I was one of the small behind the scenes crew helping Harry Brewis run the Mermaid's Donkey Kong 64 charity stream, which raised a lot of money. Another small thing I did was in January this year, I raised around $340,000, $350,000 for a trans charity in the UK to spite a former comedy writer. And I have given like a little bit of behind the scenes help or been a guest on a lot of other charity streams, mostly run by people I know who are video essayists or filmmakers or tabletop RPG streamers. The three most important aspects of running a charity stream that maybe aren't given enough time or thought before streams launch are planning and scheduling, counting that as one, teamwork, and just how exhausting running a charity stream is. I've done taxing physical work. I've been on lots of short film shoots with like 13 to 17 hour days where I was responsible for all these different aspects of production, running around doing jobs that would have been done by multiple people on a film shoot that had money. And running a charity stream or just being a part of a team running a charity stream is as exhausting. It's not just sitting at a computer. On top of worrying about so many technical aspects that could go wrong and almost inevitably go wrong, you are trying to keep up with and interact with chat and incentivize them to donate. You might be dealing with guests, and if so, you're worrying about them having a good time and keeping everything on schedule. If you're partnered with a charity with a very specific family-friendly brand like we did with Make-A-Wish, then you have to keep reminding guests not to cuss. Don't cuss! Oh. You have to be cognizant of what you're representing. If you're raising money for a group, you don't want to get them in trouble or upset them. And on top of dealing with technical issues and scheduling and the stress of being a performer, of being on and being broadcasted all day under public viewing and scrutiny, which you may not be used to, raising money for charity can be really emotional in a way you might not expect. You probably chose a group or a cause that's meaningful to you and to your audience. And the generosity of people giving to a cause like that can be very humbling and sometimes overwhelming. Like, this is awesome. We've raised over $1,800. My initial goal was like a thousand. So we've almost doubled that. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm not an emotional person, but at the end of the mermaid stream, I was just crying. It was completely overwhelming. So be ready to be tired and maybe schedule a full day off after running a big multi-day stream because you can crash after days of that adrenaline high emotional roller coaster. Remember too, there's a lot you can do ahead of time to help mitigate the stress of running a stream, which brings us back to planning and scheduling and teamwork. And planning isn't just, oh, I'm going to play this video game and have these guests on this day or have this person run this tabletop game this day. My advice is to get a calendar or spreadsheet and ask people you want to guest at least a week ahead of time for specific hours they can come on. So you have a rough full schedule outlined with breaks built in for technical problems or whatever else. And to ask a bunch of people you know and trust, not only to guest and to recommend guests, but also if they can help moderate your chat or help you with technical problems. Joel, who runs Critical Bits, along with my friend Rebecca, who does a lot of streaming and of Peeves Reads fame, and my friend David, who made TV Night and made Smalls Island Woes and Running Late With Me, were all a huge help on the Make-A-Wish stream. Because my internet couldn't handle a Zoom call and OBS at the same time, and I couldn't stream, it, it kept cutting out. And I didn't really have time to try to recalibrate settings or fi fix my internet, I don't know. So while I scheduled everything and I made overlays and found guests and I was on some of the panels myself, the three of them actually did the technical work of running the stream for me, routing a Zoom call through OBS to Twitch. So if my internet cut out, it didn't kill the stream. If I didn't have them to rely on as backup, I don't know what I would have done. Part of planning too, like long-term planning, is building on a skill set and getting experience helping other people with their streams. For the first Spider Day stream, I was at Joel's house all weekend helping him run it and learning how to use OBS. For the Mermaid stream, I had probably no technical input, but I did a lot of work behind the scenes with organization, helping find and vet guests, helping organize and run the Discord channel. That stream ballooned massively in size as we were running it, and we had to build a lot of it as we went. Because it turns out that when you give a lot of people who actually know how to organize things access to a server where other people can call in and just be on the stream, that maybe they should figure out who could be on it 
And maybe, maybe you, you, they don't just invite Harry's friends, who he reckons would be fun, and they start like asking people who maybe know things about the topic being discussed, you know, who maybe know more than me. I don't know much of anything, frankly. It's also helpful to learn Photoshop or a similar open source program if you aren't already familiar, and make overlays and find a way to incorporate charity information and your donation goal and the information of whatever guests you have on, on screen while you're streaming. The overlays don't have to look amazing, like I think some of ours look better than others. They just need to look somewhat professional and show some effort was put into the look of the stream. You want to at least appear reputable if you want people to give you money, even for a charity. For the Make-A-Wish stream, I finally learned how to use Nightbot, a free Twitch bot that's easy to use that has prompts you can set up to use in chat and it can run giveaways or post your donation link or list incentives. Like we would have certain incentives for certain games and I could just run in and go change that and then I could keep using it as a prompt to show them in chat. Consider accessibility as well. We are currently looking into live auto captioning to make our streams more accessible. There are free services like Web Captioner available, though it is kind of complicated to learn how to incorporate them, but I think it's worth trying to, at least trying to put the effort in. And be considerate of guests. Make room on your overlay for their website or Twitter handle and their pronouns and whatever other relevant information and make sure they have a way to message you or someone helping you run the stream if they have an emergency and need to go or if they're uncomfortable with anything going on. Make sure at least one person is actively monitoring a behind the scenes chat so if someone has an issue, they don't have to say it live on the internet with an audience. Beforehand, just make sure your guests are comfortable with who else they're going to be on with or what they're going to be doing or what they're going to be saying or with the charity. Don't spring anything on anyone too. And there are lots of free safety tools available for tabletop roleplay specifically. I'll link a safety tools compilation put together by Kiana Shaw in the description. Just remember, it's important to check in ahead of time for everyone's comfort and safety and keep checking in as the stream is going, along with making sure you're representing your chosen charity in line with how they want to be represented. You should communicate professionally with your guests and with the charity you're supporting. My friend Rebecca ran a charity stream I was on for a charity local to her, and she tried routing donations directly to the charity rather than through her PayPal or through something like Toltify or whatever to save them on fees. But after a while, they rejected all of our donations, thinking they were some kind of scam. So even if you aren't used to it, or if it feels awkward at first, it's really helpful to contact a charity and establish a relationship with them before streaming, especially small charities like that one. Typically, the charity will be happy to interact with you on social media to promote the stream and will give you guidelines and branding information and copy to read off, and information on what specifically donations will be used for, all of which is useful to incentivize donations during your stream. I know this is a lot of work and might feel weird and like brand speak if you aren't used to it, but if you're putting on a charity stream and representing a charity, you should do it properly. And work like this put in ahead of time can help you avoid a lot of problems once you go live. Also consider ahead of time what you're comfortable doing for money for a charity and also make sure it doesn't break Twitch's terms of service. I don't stream on my own, and I haven't streamed a ton with Critical Bits or Struggle Session. I am very uncomfortable with the donate to have me read out your message and thank you and pretend I'm your friend parasocial aspect of Twitch, and I don't want my fans to ever feel like they have that access to me, but for occasional charity streams, for something other than myself and representing something other than myself, I'm totally fine with it, and I've done stuff like write Benford on my own forehead during a home improvement tabletop game. Yeah. <laughs> Ben yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ben Forb. Ben Forb. Ben Forb. Welcome to Ben Forb Tools. To mirror, but... <laughs> <laughs> I got some hand sanitizer. Oh, geez. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so hard. It's like. Like a uh, backwards etch a sketch or something. Or read off a speech from Critical Bits over and over for donations. Try to think of unique novel stuff you can do as well. Julian Aaron from DNDIY at Flipping the Table came on our Make a Wish stream and did a dice making demonstration, which was really cool. And then we gave the dice away to someone in chat. Like, I don't know how to make dice. <laughs> I couldn't have done that. And, and they offered to do it. And I was like, that sounds awesome. I also don't have sponsors for any YouTube streaming or podcasting work I do, and I don't want them. But for charity streams, I have no problem reaching out to relevant groups or companies to see if they'll donate merchandise to give away during the stream or to promote it. It takes just a couple of minutes to send a polite email to a company asking for small merchandise donations specifically. Consider what your options are and what companies you could reach out to that are relevant to what you're doing, like 
dice companies for a tabletop stream. Also, if you're doing a paid raffle, you get into a very weird legal area, in the US at least. Honestly, any giveaways can have unexpected, weird legal aspects to them, so do your research there and be careful if you're making people give a donation to be considered for a specific giveaway. It costs you nothing to reach out to people you know for help, and you may be surprised by how many people are there to help you. Rebecca designed the Spider Day t-shirts we sold through Bonfire, which raised a lot of extra money for us. Flipping the table, they're like an Atlanta-based tabletop streaming group, who I didn't know very well before my Make-A-Wish stream, was a tremendous help for us, and they put a lot of time and help and money into our stream. I'm really grateful, and it was awesome. That's part of offering to help guest on or moderate or give technical help to other charity streams, too. You meet reliable people and get help learning to run something that would be much more difficult to run on your own. Watch other charity streams to get ideas as well. Even in areas that you yourself aren't interested in streaming in, or even if they're not doing that great of a job, and learn from what they do, and volunteer when you can to help out to build that skill set and meet people to work with in the future. There's a Reddit thread from someone with the username Zcoticus with some good basic advice on running charity streams, and one of the things they talk about is after the stream, really interrogating what went well and what didn't, and soliciting feedback. They say, this is very important. Take time to go through your VODs, stats, and everything else. Think about the following. What did the community react most positively to? What was a flop? What goals attracted the most donations? What goals didn't get any attention? What was the reaction from the community at the time to each reward or goal? Get feedback from as many people as possible. Make a Google form with a bunch of questions and ask people to fill it out. Get feedback directly from your mod team and friends. If a representative of the charity stopped by, get feedback from them. So this may seem like a lot. It is. When you are doing an event, you have to do it right and it takes work. Plan, execute, and evaluate. Don't take half measures. Don't skip on the research and don't wing it. If you want to successfully raise money for and promote a charity, you have to put in a lot of work. If you don't want to put in the work, you probably aren't doing it for the charity. Which, going forward, I'm going to take this advice for sure as far as soliciting feedback and going back over stats and sending out a Google form and everything. It seems like awesome advice. They also say in big bold letters, if you are doing a charity stream to get followers, you are doing it for the wrong reason. And this is fantastic advice. A lot of the work I've done on charity streams has been very behind the scenes, or it's been time spent making overlays or doing work on scheduling for games and panels I won't even be on. And you will be more helpful and learn more if you focus on learning how to do this well and be as much help as you can in your own individual way versus trying to be center stage. It's not a secret that I helped run the mermaid stream, but it's also not something I talk talk about a whole lot, because I did it to help my friend and to help a cause I care about, not to make myself look good. On the other end too, as a guest, I don't really like it when people use charity streams as an opportunity to self-promote. It's different if the cause is personal to you and if you're talking about your experiences or if you're being asked to talk about your work in like an interview or conversationally on stream. And if people want to run their own streams this way, that's fine. But I try to just come on and be entertaining and fill whatever role they're expecting of me when I guest versus using a stream for attention or to network specifically with people more e-famous than me or to get new fans. On guest spots on other other podcasts and streams and panels at conventions that aren't even for charities. I usually talk about my work at the beginning of the panel and at the end and bring it up if it's relevant, but I don't like it when people are clearly using any of these platforms, but especially charities, to push themselves on the audience. I don't say this to call anyone specific out or attack anyone. I don't even really have anyone specific in mind. It's just something that I notice here and there. But I do think it's worth saying that when you're running a charity stream or helping someone else run one, your goal should be to promote and raise money for that charity. The skill you learn and people you meet are cool bonuses for sure. And there's a tremendous psychological reward for helping a cause you care about. It feels really good. But if you're in it for you or your brand, it doesn't make for a very good stream. It can be hard to figure out exactly what you want to stream, too. For Critical Bits, we usually just did tabletop streams and some weird experimental stuff. But for the Make-A-Wish stream, I had a quiz show and interviews of and panel-style discussions with people I know and think are interesting. And then I had some social issue panels pitched to me by guests, and I thought those sounded really great, and I was happy to have a platform for them. I could have just pushed really hard for the people I know with the biggest audiences to come on, but even for a charity, it's important to try to balance maximizing views and maximizing money with building something cool and having diverse programming that you can be proud of after the fact and that you can hand over to guests to put on their own channels or patreons or whatever and to give a platform to people you think are cool who have cool stuff to say and letting them do what they want really building something or trying to build something from the ground up 
Especially if you're like me and you don't pull hundreds or thousands of viewers on a stream yourself. So you have some room to grow and experiment. Versus like, oh, who's the biggest name we can get who will pull the biggest numbers? Especially if a lot of the bigger names you might know or be able to reach out to are all like able-bodied cishet white dudes. Versus having a more robust, diverse lineup of people who will add to your stream in ways other than being e-famous and pulling numbers. I'm just recommending a balance. I'm not saying it's bad if... <laughs> You know, I, I, people feel so attacked sometimes with stuff like this. I always say just consider who you're having on and what bringing in a more diverse group of people would add to it. I highly recommend watching Harry's presentation he did at XOXO Fest after the Mermaid stream. It's really great advice and it's really lovely and touching and edifying. And I've been using some clips of it in this video already. And he talks a lot about what it was like having the stream take off and what was meaningful about it to him. Like, check out this part. And uh, by this point, a very large and diverse group of trans people from uh, all kinds of different walks of life, different countries, different experiences, are coming on just to, just to talk about their lives. And I joked before that it was no longer just a bunch of my friends coming on, but I feel like I made a lot of friends as a result of this. And I'm very thankful for the work that Casey and Dan have done. A trans woman named Melody came on to talk about how mermaids saved her life. Um, the, the difference that a call made when she was in a dark place and needed help. And later we managed to get her back on uh, while Susie was on, the CEO of Mermaids, to talk to her directly. And that for me is one of the highlights of the whole, of the whole stream. But my actual favorite moment in the stream happened 50 hours and 30 minutes in. Uh, one of our guests on uh, was with their partner, uh, who is trans and disabled. And uh, they mentioned uh, that they had a GoFundMe for their wheelchair. The, they wanted to get a new wheelchair because they're having problems um, with their current equipment. And the goal was uh, 750 pounds. And uh, four minutes later, they hit refresh on that GoFundMe uh, to find that it was now 1,000 pounds over their initial goal. And as this couple burst into shocked cry laughter, I pulled that face. Um, <laughs> and I realized, oh yeah, this this stuff affects people and it's happening now and we can just tell people about things. There's a balance between, as Zikotic has said, analyzing numbers and being very critical and trying to maximize donations to the best of your ability versus giving yourself the flexibility to do more with and learn as much as you can from the stream and trying to have diverse guests and diverse programming on top of that. They're not mutually exclusive, but I think a lot of streams could have a better balance. I was track director for the new media track for Con Carolinas for 2020, and because of the pandemic, all that went online. And after running it, that made me want to try way more convention style panels for streaming, just to make something that also has longevity outside of the charity stream. For my Make-A-Wish stream, we had our classic tabletop games and us just talking and playing video games. And some streams had guests with bigger names than others. And honestly, the view counts weren't that different. And a lot of the donations, though not all of them, came from our core audience or the Flipping the Table core audience anyway. That's my experience in general. Just having a big guest or working with someone better known than you isn't some kind of key to unlocking massive success, charity streams or otherwise. So you might as well focus on a good balance and putting together something you can be proud of. A stacked lineup of people with huge audiences is different and would obviously help you net a lot more in donations. I mean that and a lot of press helped the mermaid stream tremendously. But if you're watching this video, I, I doubt that that's accessible to you. And of course, if you have the kind of huge audience where you can raise tens of thousands of dollars just playing video games on stream with your friends, then that's cool too. That model works and you can build a ton of energy and momentum with it and have an audience who is engaged and having fun and the charities get money either way. But consider that a charity platform is still a platform and you can always keep experimenting and finding new ways to use your platform, however big or small. And you can make it educational or experiment with it or just make it an event, you know? In March, Twitch put out a little charity streaming best practices guide for planning COVID-related charity streams. It's super basic. The advice is to create a campaign page, promote the event, set up moderation tools, and start early. Also advising to not collect donations directly and instead use something like Toltify, where people know donations go right to the charity, and of course, to not break terms of service. While researching this video, I also found a site called CharityLivestream.com. It's still in the planning stages, if it is even ever gonna be completed and fully released at all, 
there are a lot of pay only features without the price being listed and a lot of pages are incomplete but it has a ton of guides up as well as a lot of organizational advice there are also both older versions and updated versions of sections of a main guide from 2015 and 2019 respectively so while some stuff is outdated or incomplete depending on which version you're looking at it's full of super in-depth advice like how to validate nonprofits, or detailed advice on what to look for from a donation platform, or how to choose what charity to support, or what roles to make sure you have filled for a stream. Core roles that are suggested being broadcasting and entertainment, chat mod and outreach and promotion, and more being writer, press contact, artist, video editor, event organization, and tech. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't read all of it or compared the older and newer guides just because it's a lot. It's a lot to read. But if you want an in-depth resource, it's the best I've found, and it's certainly better than Twitch's 1 PNG of advice on how to raise money to help people impacted by COVID. I'm not endorsing everything on the website. A lot of it is very much marketing jargon and other segments are there to promote the site itself, which isn't even fully functional yet. And like with anything, do your own research. But if you want advice that's way more specific and in-depth than this video, do check it out. And I'm definitely going to be referring to it for future streams I do as well and taking the advice it gives into consideration. Kiana Shaw, whose safety tools I mentioned earlier, is fantastic. And they also made a charity stream guide in the form of a 101 Google Doc. Of course, linked in the description. Shaw's guide focuses on advice regarding donation logistics, incentives, and goals, rewards, giveaways, promotions, casting, and types of streams to do, and pros and cons to all sorts of methods. So if you're trying to figure out logistics and figure out how and what to stream, check their guide out. Bijan Steven wrote a piece for The Verge on running his first charity stream recently and also interviewed Shaw for some of it. It's great and you should read it all too. It's it's not super long. Um, it's not like the, the, the huge guide I talked about earlier. Link in description. Here are some points he and Shaw make that I thought were worth bringing up. If you're planning for your stream to be slightly more elaborate, I think the most important features to consider are length, guests, and a donation thermometer. You will be overwhelmed and it will be glorious. The more people you involve, the more complicated these things tend to get, at least from a production standpoint. You should aim to make something as polished as it possibly can be, while also understanding that what you're doing is actually just producing live television. Which is to say, it's hard, and things will probably go wrong when you're live. From Steven. The main thing to keep in mind is that the stream is not about you. It's about the cause you've chosen to support. And from Shaw, charity streaming should be an end, not about people patting on the back and telling you how good of a job you did. After working on a few different charity streams, I now kind of look at them the way I look at filmmaking. They should be collaborative and as meticulously planned as possible. In filmmaking, a shot list and detailed shooting script can save you a ton of time the same way setting up a support network and carefully scheduling guests and communicating with charities can save you a lot of time during a charity stream. All that work can pay off in assembling something you can be proud of for a good cause. And programming could be more serious like interviewing people involved with or in impacted by the charity, serious doesn't mean boring, or it can still be lighter in tone. One of my favorite things I got to do for our Make-A-Wish stream was interviewing Jen De La Vega, who is a player on Fun City Ventures and a professional chef and someone who writes and is involved with zine making. And I'm really into food and cooking and tabletop and zines. So it was super cool to talk to her and afterwards give her the interview file to put up on her Patreon and use however she wanted. And I got to make an overlay using a photo of food she made and we were both little toasts on it. It was like my favorite overlay that I made. On top of more diversity and covering serious topics, I feel like ambition and creativity are undervalued in the online content creation sphere. And I always wish people would branch out more. Like Steven said, it's like live TV. If you were putting on, if you got like a public access TV show, I would hope you would use that as an opportunity to do something different, something cool, something interesting or like engaging or meaningful. We also did a bunch of fake commercials for one of our non-charity streams and a fake PSA. Mountain Dew. Caffeine-free Mountain Dew. Diet Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew Code Red. Mountain Dew Live Wire. Mountain Dew Pitch Black. And making stuff like that and overlays are both cheap and easy to do if you know how to edit and use Photoshop or have a friend who does. But they can add a lot of production value. Or just like videos to play in downtime or in between stuff or whatever. I had nothing to do with planning it or executing it, but I was briefly on Super Eyepatch Wolf's Black Lives Matter stream a little while ago. And he had a whole segment where someone came in dressed, he was, he was streaming Undertale, and he had someone come in dressed as Sans. Get out of here, you 
Goddamn skeleton! Get out of here! What's going on? Damn it! I'm so sorry about that, everyone. That I don't know what even happened there. Uh, let's just ignore that. That is that is fine. It doesn't matter what just happened. Let's just move on. And it was very, very funny and very, very strange. And I think even just do stuff like that. That doesn't cost any money. That's a printed out Sans mask. But just play around with the format and do do do, do stuff. That's what I always like to see is like people experimenting with formats and finding new and interesting ways to use formats. If you haven't developed any technical skills or if technical skills aren't your forte and you don't have like an audience built in, but you have an okay paying job and you can afford to just donate directly and you're wondering if you should just do that. Like I had people, I asked for if people needed advice for charity streams and a couple people were sort of like, should I just donate? That's your call to make. One way to look at it is the skills you build now now with charity streaming can be useful in the future or just useful to you generally. So it's not like it hurts to put a stream on if you don't think you'll raise that much, but you can also try to help with a different stream someone else is running or even just as a chat moderator or just donate directly without fanfare to a cause you care about. What you do is up to you and will probably require some trial and error and might require failure, but that's okay. It's just important that you do it rather than worrying about failure or worrying about doing it wrong. If you are nervous about not raising a lot of money, fear of failure or coming up short seems to hold a lot of people back from any kind of project, including charity streams. Consider any stream, on top of calling attention to and raising money for a cause, an opportunity to both learn how to do a better job next time and a way to produce programming you can be proud of that can have longevity and meaning outside of the stream as well. If you only raise $100, that's still $100 more than that charity had before. And if you learn you technical skills and interpersonal skills and put together an engaging and entertaining stream with cool people who will want to work with you again even if like five people watched it that's not a loss and when we're dealing with a global pandemic health crisis and a global movement for racial justice and against police brutality it's good to have the skills and organizational tools and network to help raise money in support of people who need it I'd also advise you to get involved locally, especially after the pandemic, and look for smaller organizations that you have some kind of personal connection to, or that you're located close to, so you can develop a relationship with that organization, or at least with your local branch of that organization. Joel has also done some volunteer video work for Covenant House Georgia, and I'd love to do more with Make-A-Wish Georgia in the future. And I've been looking into other smaller or Georgia or Southeast based organizations as well. I'm also happy to work with big national organizations and I have no problem with that, especially in times of need. And with bigger organizations, you can get more donations just off of name recognition when they're well established. But if you plan to do charity streams as an ongoing project, it's helpful to look around you and see what's important to and accessible to you to get involved with because it's really useful to develop that kind of relationship with the people running a charity. And that's easier to do if they're like, lesser known or closer by and, and like I said after the pandemic you can actually meet them in person and plan stuff in person. I don't think it's a mistake to work with big national organizations but it's been cool for us with Critical Bits which is not which is also not a huge brand to develop working relationships with smaller charities or local branches of charities. Speaking of getting involved with cool local stuff, as far as my upcoming charity stream work, Joel and I were approached by the Highlander Center, an incredible center self-described as a catalyst for grassroots organizing and movement building in Appalachia and the South that works with people fighting for justice, equality, and sustainability, supporting their efforts to take collective action to shape their own destiny. To do a streaming event for them, so our current plan is to do a big convention-style stream the weekend of September 25th fifth with panels and tabletop games. I'm really excited about that and excited that we have some time to plan it out. Whenever we have more information on that, I'll link it in the description. I'll probably make like a little promo video for it. I feel very privileged to work with the Highlander Center. I'm really excited and I'm very excited for what we're planning and what we're going to put on. So that's what's coming up for me. To close, here's some lovely stuff Steven and Shaw said in the Verge piece. Don't get discouraged. Oftentimes you'll kind of see the numbers as a newcomer streamer or charity streamer and might feel a little discouraged because you have a concept of what goal you want to hit, which you might not, Shaw says. But I think a huge part of it is remembering that it doesn't matter how much you raise, it matters that you did something. And from Steven, I don't really know how or why it worked. I only know that it did. The guests were wonderful and gracious and my co-host was perfect. The viewers, however, made the stream. They kept our energy up and donated a frankly incredible amount of money. By the end, I felt like I was mostly just a conductor because by then it had its own momentum. It felt alive. 
And you can do all this too. Before we went live, in one of the many conversations we had leading up to the stream, Rob told me that we were using our dumbass superpower. Our collective ability to get people to pay attention to something for the right reasons, which put things into perspective for me. Charity streaming is all about deciding to use your powers for good. You can plan things in advance. Uh, and also, to really make a difference in the world, um, very often we have to organize. Sometimes you actually need to, to do things. Like, ultimately, basically 90% of my life is I tweet. That's not activism. That's not really a, a thing. I don't feel like I'm really contributing in that way. And I think we have to work together to find ways that we really can make a difference, or we ultimately won't, even if we feel like we might be able to. And um, I think it's very... It's very easy to want change and much harder to go, well, how do we actually do this? And uh, I didn't achieve any of that with this, you know, but I realized that was the thing I could have learned to do, so I figured I might, you know, someone else do a better thing than me. That's the general point of this. Um, and the last thing is that more people care than you think. Um, I expected everyone to go, oh, that's nice, and then go on with their lives. As it turns out that an awful lot of people do care about this issue. and. I think very often because of the complete atomization of our society um, under a big word uh, that means uh, w workers not owning anything, um, <laughs> uh, it's easy to believe that you're on your own here, but it turns out that we're actually not alone. Um, you know, XOXO is a wonderful place, there's some great people here, but it turns out that there's a maximum size at this venue. Um, <laughs> And there are more of us than we can actually imagine. Um, the list of people who don't understand these issues or don't care or who think these people don't exist uh, is unfortunately quite long right now. But the list of people who believe and actually want to make things better is an awful lot longer. And that's the main thing that I learned. Um, so. Thank you all very much for redeeming my faith in humanity. The stream Steven did was called the 1312 stream, and it was explicitly about raising money to abolish the carceral state. And I saw some of it as it aired actually, and it was fantastic. And what better way to use your platform than like Harry did to say that trans people and trans children specifically deserve love and support. Or like Bijan Steven did to say that black lives matter and that we live in a nightmarish fascist and racist carceral state that has to change. And as me, Shannon, on my platform, I'd like to say support trans people and that black lives matter and take care of each other and just ACAB, man. I hope everyone's doing okay. Please take care, and if you have a platform, please use it to do some good. Change is granular. We like to think of history as a series of curtains that open, and we arrive at a better age every single time. You know, someone uh, decides uh, not to go to the back of a bus, and then racism is over. Or um, <laughs> Hamilton comes out, and racism is over. Uh, <laughs> but it turns out that these things are specific, and they take a very long time. And uh, my friend May, who runs the YouTube channel Nixphere, is a wonderful trans woman who makes amazing videos that I can't stop plugging, um, mentioned that none of this, none of, like the financial aspect of this is a minor part. What matters is the support, is the sense of solidarity and, and friendship. And you can make a very big difference in someone's lives. Yes, with money, obviously. Uh, the, the moment with the wheelchair was amazing. But, also just by being friends with people, by letting people know that you care and that they're valuable to you. Because often we don't like to say that. You know, it's easier to argue with people that you ultimately agree with than it is to tell them that you like them sometimes. Um, so on that note, I, I love you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, change is, change is granular, so... So there, that's that slide done. Uh, the next thing is, community is magical. Uh, I emulated GDQ and then brought on people who emulated it better than me. Um, and actually, by letting um, the, the trans community, as it were, know that a thing was happening for them, it, didn't, it became a thing, it became a momentary consensus that everyone could feel involved in. And ultimately, that's how things really get done. You know, I'm, I just, I'm just a guy who played Donkey Kong. Um, but a lot of people wanted the thing I was doing it for to happen. 
and that's really what mattered. You know? uh, I really didn't do anything. I was in bed a large portion of the time. Um, <laughs> the other lesson I learned is a much more personal one. Um, it's that your friends will save you. Um, there are, if you surround yourself with people who you can really trust, sometimes they will. They can turn, so, they can turn a thing you, that you were doing out of spite into an actual positive thing <laughs> for people. I feel like I was saved partially from myself over the course of all of this. I think secretly, we're always making one of two decisions, and we make that decision even if we don't know we're making it. Um, you're either choosing to make life worse for someone you don't like, or better for people you care about. And there is an actual difference, and I didn't realize that I'd made the wrong choice until a lot of people came over and helped change the choice retrospectively. And please keep thinking about other stuff you could be doing and what you could be doing different and, and don't stop doing that. Especially right now, I would consider it a moral obligation. Thanks. Though I feel like the world got smaller I recall all of the days I've cried Even if heaven doesn't take us, we try But you know I think if we stick to each other's guy